fine. Long term. And they set up a bunch of committees, committees on fish and fishery, fats and oil, fruits and vegetables, ground nuts, uh, nutrition and foods for special dietary uses, and so on. There are currently about 27 codex committee. There are regional organizations. There are task forces and so on. So it's a huge bureaucratic monstrosity. It's immense. Codex has promulgated well over 4,000 guidelines, standards, and regulations on everything, everything which can legally be put into your mouth with the exception of pharmaceuticals. They are not part of Codex. Important. Now, Codex standards have no legal weight whatsoever. Zero. So who cares about them? They're just standards. So we're talking about an industry-dominated regulation-setting organization. But if it has no legal standing, who cares, right? Here's the history of Codex Alimentarius before 1962. The Austro-Hungarian Empire said, we need rules by which the courts can rule on cases involving food. So we'll have regulations and rules that the courts will enforce. That's how they get their weight. That was called the Codex Alimentarius, and it was put into place around 1893 and lasted until the end of the Austro-Hungarian Empire and the First World War. So the idea was there in the Germanic tradition. We need rules, lots of rules, lots and lots of rules. We need a lot of rules. Let's have rules for everything to do with food. So it was sort of a natural extension for the German industrialists to say, we'll go back to the good old days of Codex Alimentarius, back when we had them in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Cool. So they started promulgating their rules and regulations, and they were voluntary. They were sort of guidelines. Now, Codex Alimentarius Commission is administered by the World Health Organization, WHO, and the FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization. They fund Codex, and they run it at the request of the UN. So they're mommy and daddy to Codex Alimentarius. And that's very interesting, because they're supposed to be about health and food worldwide. Some conflicts of interest that we'll talk about. So Codex started promulgating regulations and rules. And the way that's done is that the committees work up a rule, a standard, a guideline, a regulation. And then they get it to what's called step eight, which is the final step in their administrative process. And then it's presented to the Codex Alimentarius Commission for ratification, like the vitamin and mineral guideline was presented to the Codex Alimentarius Commission on July 4th this past summer. It was ratified. It was approved by consensus. And it is now, despite the propaganda that you're going to hear, if you ever hear about it in the media, it is now mandatory upon any member country of the WTO, the World Trade Organization. Well, what in the world do they have to do with it? And the answer is everything. The World Trade Organization, you see, accepted Codex when, it was, when the World Trade Organization was formed in 1994. Okay? They said, well, how are we going to dis decide trade disputes around food if we don't have a set of rules? I know. We'll accept the Codex Alimentarius rules. And all the members of the WTO worldwide will, get ready for an Orwellian term, harmonize with our standards, with the Codex standards. Harmonize. I suggest you capitalize the first four letters in your mind. So everybody's supposed to harmonize with Codex. And when they harmonize with Codex, then, if they get pulled into the World Trade Organization dispute resolution process, they have a chance of winning. Because, here's the kicker. You ready for this one? If two countries go into the World Trade Organization dispute resolution process, and one of them is Codex compliant, and one of them is not Codex compliant, the one that is Codex compliant automatically wins regardless of the merit of the case. People are using Codex compliance as a weapon in a much bigger 
economic battle. So, every country in the world is racing to do what? To become Codex compliant. So, in the United States, the situation is, okay, how do we become Codex compliant when we have laws that protect us? And you have to remember that Codex does not serve consumer well-being, does not serve health. It serves what I call the five bigs. Big Pharma, Big Chema, Big Biotechna, Big Agribiz, and Big Medica. Little you and little me are not served by Codex in the least. So before we go forward and talk about the rest of what has to happen, let's ask what Codex does. You probably all know about the vitamin and mineral guideline that was ratified on July 4th. You may not know that although it is said that Codex guidelines, regulations, and standards which have been ratified are voluntary, they are not voluntary. That is known as a lie. They are mandatory, but they are not fully mandatory until December 31st, 2009. They're sort of kind of a little bit mandatory now, and they're totally mandatory then. Okay, so what does Codex do? Why do I care enough about Codex to close my practice and stop treating patients who came to me from around the world to help them regain their health and be radiantly well with non-toxic means, which is a very satisfying thing to do. I love it. And it also provided me with an income. I, that was nice. Um, why am I concerned enough? Okay, let's talk about the vitamin and mineral guideline first. In 1994, here in the United States, DSHEA, the Dietary Supplements Health and Education Act, was passed, which classifies nutrients and herbs as foods. As foods, you can set no upper limit on them. You cannot set an upper limit on lettuce, lamb, or rutabagas. And similarly, you cannot set an upper limit on vitamin C, echinacea, ginkgo biloba, vitamin D. And access to nutrients is freely given to us. We are allowed to have any nutrients we want because, and this is a very important point, under common law, anything not forbidden is permitted. Codex, on the other hand, is a Napoleonic Code law system. Under Napoleonic Code, anything not permitted is forbidden. That's called a positive list. So, vitamins and nutrient, minerals. In 1994, we passed a Shea. Nutrients are foods. We can have as much of them as we want. It's our business. In 1994, Codex, with no notice here in this country whatsoever, declared nutrients, put on your intellectual seatbelts, declared nutrients to be toxins. They're poisons. Dangerous industrial poisons. As poisons, we have to be protected from them. How do you protect somebody from a poison? You use toxicology. You use a science called risk assessment. A quick primer on risk assessment. First, you take the substance that's poisonous and you feed it to animals and you determine the dose that kills 50% of them. That's called the LD50, okay? And you extrapolate what the LD50 for a human being might be. Then, you go down to the other end of the dosage range and you start feeding itty bitty tiny bits of it to test animals. And you come up with the largest possible dose, the maximum permissible upper limit, that can be fed to an animal before a discernible impact is shown. Okay? No discernible impact. Then you divide that by 100. That's how they do it in risk assessment. And now you've got a safety margin. So you've got one one-hundredth of the dose that can be given, the largest dose that can be given with no discernible impact. Okay? Nutrients under codex. 
not only are limited to those nutrients on the positive list, and we anticipate there will be 18 of them, and they do not include CoQ10, glucosamine, chondroitin sulfate. They do include fluoride, which to my knowledge as a physician has absolutely no biological benefit whatsoever. But it does make people complacent. Fluoride was first used in the gulag because it was discovered that prisoners who were fed fluoridated water were complacent and you could do anything you wanted to them. They were easy to manage. So you have 18 nutrients, you have itty bitty teeny weeny little bitty doses that are determined scientifically to have no effect on any human being. Now, in this country, we have a problem. We have Deshay. We got to get rid of Deshay in order to harm Onais with Codex. That part of Codex, anyway. So how do we get rid of Deshay? We attack it legislatively, of course. And there are five, count them, five bills currently before Congress designed to overturn, gut, invalidate, and otherwise get rid of Deshay. Because once Deshay is gone, we can harmonize with a vitamin and mineral guideline. So what we're talking about is waking up one morning and being very surprised to find that high potency, therapeutically effective, clinically significant nutrients are now illegal in the way that heroin is illegal. Not available with a prescription, illegal. If these nutrients have any impact on the human body, they are illegal. That's just the vitamin and mineral guideline. Let's talk about milk. We have recombinant bovine growth hormone, and now we can choose milk with it or milk without it, butter with it, butter, butter without it, right? Not under Codex, because under Codex, every dairy cow on the planet must be treated with Monsanto's recombinant bovine growth hormone. Furthermore, under Codex, every animal used for food on the planet, whether it has fins, feet, or feathers, Every animal on the planet must be treated with subclinical antibiotics. Must be treated with subclinical antibiotics and must be treated with exogenous growth hormones. Codex requires, mandates, that all food be irradiated unless it's eaten locally and raw. All food, including organic food, of course. So is it organic afterwards? Well, of course, the organic standards are incredibly low. The organic standards allow a farmer to use veterinary drugs, including growth hormones, antibiotics, etc., on animals, and then at his whim, reclassify them as organic. But farmers are our friends, and they would never do that right. Right. Codex sets limits for the dangerous industrial chemicals that you can have in your food. And the limits are incredibly high. Go to Codex Alimentarius, do a Google search, and look, you know, there are drop down menus at the top of the official Codex page. Look at the toxins and the veterinary chemicals and the levels that are set. They are terrifying to me, terrifying. The names of the chemicals that are permitted and the amounts of the chemicals that are permitted are terrifying to me. Why am I terrified? Well, perhaps I'm just a cowardly person. It's possible. Think about this. In 2001, 176 countries, including the United States, got together and they said there are 12 really bad organic chemicals. They're called POPs. Persistent organic pollutants. There are a lot of them, but there are 12 that are so bad that nobody could disagree that those 12 POPs had to be banned worldwide. 
Nine of the 12 worst organic chemicals known are pesticides, not surprisingly, because they kill things. And of course, we have many um, uh, processes and enzyme systems that are very much like insects and other pests, so they're not too good for us. But Codex has different ideas. Codex has brought back seven, seven of the nine forbidden POPs that 176 countries banned worldwide. Dieldrin, Aldrin, hexachlorobenzene, and the food that is imported from other countries that contains these substances cannot be stopped at our borders because otherwise it would be, God forbid, a trade violation. That's how Codex works. Codex, according to the World Trade Organization and the Food and Agriculture Organization joint 